Okay, part three, everybody. Celebratory feast. As soon as Cardstaff received Judith's ordinance, he ordered me to help regain control of the North Gate. Our feast had started, and Wilfried was in particularly high spirits as he regaled us all with his tale. Because he was an underage Archduke candidate, he had initially been told to stay away from the battle, but the sudden rush of knights to the West Gate had made its northern counterpart especially vulnerable when yet another distraction had appeared. Karstadt had also concluded that our enemies might have a great enough mana capacity that someone like Wilfred would need needed to bind them. My orders were to capture them if possible, which was no easy feat, Wilfred continued. His dark green eyes sparkled as he described the battle with various chops and punches, <laughs> dictating to Roderick, who was feverishly transcribing his every word. I managed to catch a big one, though. Bro Gross him again! Four! Wait, there's either, it's three body doubles in the original, or there's four body doubles and he's still out there. Jesus Christ! How many does this guy have? I got the old Gabe Gerlock. Let me guess, you're too shocked for words. Well, that's another Grossom for the pile. Grossom's name had cropped up during tales of so many battles that I was starting to lose track of them all. Surely this was the last one. Surely there couldn't be more. I know! Just thinking about it was making me kind of sick. I bound Grossom with my staff and... A question, if you would allow me. Roderick's pen was hovering over his paper. Were the decoy troops at the North Gate wearing silver capes? Hmm. Wolfrey thought for a moment. They were, but the capes had normal cloth on the inside. As soon as they turned over, Mana worked on them just fine. The invaders had apparently blocked about half of our knights' attacks up by holding up their capes, but because they were riding atop high beasts, they hadn't been able to fully cover themselves with silver. It had taken quite some time, but Wolfrey ultimately succeeded in capturing Grossum, quote-unquote. I took him to the Knight's Order and couldn't believe it when they told me he was the third Grossum to show up in Aaronfest. Rosemont, you fought one too, right? How did your battle go? You can ask Hartman over there for the details, I said. He will explain things not even I can remember. Hmm. Hartman, huh? Well, we muttered with a slight grimace, casting an eye on the large group that had gathered. Hartman was eagerly describing the Battle of Gerlock while Clarissa gleefully recounted the Battle of Aaronsbach. Oh, boy. They w all he has to do is, yeah, go over and listen. That's all he has to do. They went into excruciating detail so exaggerated and overflowing with the names of gods that I wanted to sigh. If you would rather avoid Hartmut, might as well just speaking with Lady Handler, I said. She commanded three wolf and nails against Lanzanovian soldiers while in Ehrensbach, attacked uh, Grossom the instant he was open, and fought with vigor befitting a Dunkelfelder Archduke candidate. Handler was currently engaged in a lively conversation with Elvira, who gave a sincere thank you as my mother before switching back into her noble persona. From there, Elvira launched into a broad discussion of the various battles and Dunkelberger's accomplishments in them. Normal enough, I thought, but then she proposed giving Handler an advanced copy of Love Stories of the Gods. Oh, no. By way of thanks, not even I'd read that book yet. And the gesture moved Handler so deeply that tears began to well in her red eyes. Oh, It wasn't long before she was extolling the stories Elvira and her ladies had written, which in turn provided more material for Elvira to draw from. Is it not about time for us to separate Mother and Lady Handler, I asked. And interrupt their fun, Wolfried replied. I mean, I realize it must be a little uncomfortable for you, but... Not just a little. Lady Handler is speaking about me like I'm a goddess from one of their stories. And when I moved to stop Elvira from putting her daughter, daughter's heroics in book form, Handler gleefully leaned forward and said, You would turn my retelling into a story? From there, Handler began detailing everything she knew about recent events, starting from when we'd arrived at Dunkelberger's Country Gate. Problematically enough, not only was she exaggerating as much as Clarissa, ah oh shit, but she was also putting a romantic spin on things that I would tell, that I could tell would drive my crazy. Ah oh, no! Hammer, why? Why was the betrayal? Why? Oh no! Oh no, and this is where probably some of the others are going to kind of mention her whole writing the high beast thing, and uh... Some, probably some other stuff, too. I don't even remember what else was considered inappropriate. Besides the writing of the High Beast. Can somebody remind me, please? That'd be great. Ferdinand looks not too pleased. Oh, no. In a moment-to-moment -moment basis, or on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, Handler wasn't saying anything untrue, so there was no room for Ferdinand or me to interject. All we could do was sit quietly as she continued to dig us into a deeper and deeper hole! If you're this bothered about it, you shouldn't have gone to Aaron's Buck in the first place. That's got nothing to do with it! That has 
nothing to do with it. If she hadn't done that, Ferdinand would have died. And that's got nothing to do with the whole romance thing. Well, for your mark. Do you really mean that I snapped? Are you saying it would have been better to leave Ferdinand to die? No, I'm saying that you kept declaring how you wouldn't mind making enemies of the royal family and the gods, so it's weird that you're complaining about simple rumors. Just admit you fallen in No! <laughs> Interesting. I don't think she has. Though, then again, I don't think she knows her own feelings when it comes to romance because, you know, she's got her own view of romance when it comes to our world. And she's still trying to understand the romance in this world. So, I guess according to her own context from our world, I don't think she thinks that. She probably thinks of him like fam, like, you know, like, uh, like, you know, like Wilfred said, uncle, like an uncle, essentially. But I don't know. Maybe? I don't, I don't know anymore at this point. Seriously? I am not in love with him. How many times do I even say it? <laughs> no matter how much I protested, the others merely slept a little. Oh my god. Uh, who is this? For Sante best bestowed upon you her aid when she saw a walkler and died. <laughs> Who are these people? Uh, Ugarin. Uh, Ugarin. Ugarin. You the race to their visitation. You must be troubled by the weight of the sit rap raffle you have been given. I've just been hit by so many names that I struggled to par parse their meaning. I'm not even sure what it means either because I don't even. You know more about the gods than I do, Rosemine. Still, from the other's tones and expressions, I could guess they were trying to console me somehow. The fact that they were all ignoring my objections was putting me more and more on edge. Forget about falling in love. I've never even crushed on someone. Technically, uh, the only kind of, any kind of romance you've been any kind of around is when uh, Lutz made you blush back in, in book one, I think. When he commented that your hair smelled nice and he smelled it. <laughs> That's the closest thing to crushing you've gotten, girl. Uncle doesn't seem that bothered, Wilfred added with a grin and pointed at Ferdinand. What the fuck? I glanced over, wanting to see what he meant, and then he immediately looked away again. Ferdinand was wearing the same- No, you idiot! You don't understand Ferdinand's me expressions! Rosemine does. When he puts on that smile like that, it means he's very uncomfortable. Or it's just his noble persona. Oh my god. Ugh. Same dazzling smile he put on whenever he was in the absolute worst mood. The smile he'd worn when facing Georgine and throughout his engagement to Dead Linda. How can you say that when he's making his extremely displeased face, I asked. Seeing it scares me so much that I'm too afraid to even approach him. That's his displeased face? I should probably take my leave then. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Someone should have told you that a long time ago, Wilfried. Definitely. And with that, Wilfried beat a hasty retreat, muttering something about how hard Ferdinand was to understand. Yeah! I wanted to flee with him. Sister, Malcor said not even a moment later, it was like he'd been actively waiting for Wilfried to leave. Just a few moments ago, Milcor and his guard knights had been smiling and telling everyone about the traps fake Georgine had run into. She had been covered in silver cloth to the point that not even her face had been visible, and she'd sprinted into so many traps while fleeing from the knights inside the temple that I couldn't help but laugh. Ha ha ha! Who was the fake Georgine, I wonder? Hmm. Was it another devouring soldier, or was it a... I don't know what the fuck it was. It almost sounded comical. The fake Georgine had charged into the book room, slipped on the head bead-sized face stones covering the floor. <laughs> I can't wait for this to be animated. Oh my god, it's gonna be funny. Covering the floor and collapsed in a loud, cartoonish manner. Melkor and his guard knights had known the room was filled with traps. They waited outside and watched, their bows drawn as the traps had activated one by one. For several moments, the fake Georgine had remained on the floor, seemingly at a loss. Then she tried to get up, only to fall down again and again in an increasingly humorous <laughs> fashion, and she'd struggled to navigate the face stones. Her struggles hadn't ended there, though. The next part of the room had been slathered with a particularly strong adhesive. Her silver gloves and shoes had stuck to it, and the instant she pulled out her hands, the archers had started shooting at her newly exposed skin. 
Oh! Wait, where did the regular Georgian come in, though? Because they said that that was the fake, and that they had been sent to the Ivory Tower where they activated that trap. But when did the real Georgine come into play? Because there was only five that went inside, and the other four had been torn apart by the shoe mills. Huh. The fake Georgine had twisted her body to avoid the arrows, then succeeded in getting out of her shoes and escaping the adhesive. Beyond it, however, we had placed invisible teleporters. She had touched one with a bare hand and vanished, leaving only her clothes behind. Apparently, she had reappeared inside the ivory tower in her undergarments. Oops. <laughs> Your group certainly is popular, Melkor. Everyone really seems to enjoy the stories you've told. The traps you and Hartmut set are what makes them so amusing, sister. That said, did we truly find the real Lady Georgina? I asked quietly. Grossum had so many body doubles, it worries me to no end that there might be more we simply haven't found. Melkor shook his head. The one who appeared in the Foundations Hall was the real one. There can be no mistaking it. I've told several of our prisoners... Died one after another when father dealt with her. Oh, okay. Name Swarns. Oh, no, not Name Swarns, because if, uh, if Georgine had died, then yes, they would have died with her. Okay, so is Georgine dead, or is she alive, or what? I see, I said with a relief sigh. Melkor lowered his voice a little. Mother captured a Lady Georgine as well, apparently. What? Florencia did? Yes, I'm told she caught her at the exit of the castle's hidden passageways. Is that... That's not the real one, then. So... What the fuck? Oh my god, this is so weird! Sylvester had realized that Georgine knew all of the castle's secret passageways thanks to the incident that had put me in a derive. Thus, he had stealthily remade them and told no one. Oh, nice! Nice one, Sylvester! I'm guessing he used the Entwicon for that one. Thus, he had stealthily remade them and told no one, ensuring that every single older path led to the same place. The fake Georgine hadn't noticed the alterations and ended up right where Florencia was waiting for her. I didn't know she was part of the fighting too, especially considering she's pregnant. Her retainer, Lit Brecht, prepared all sorts of traps and magic tools for her, it would seem. Well, he is Hartmut's father. It stands to reason that's how he's good with these kinds of things. Yeah, I agree. Florencia had clapped st stabbed ceiling bracelets on the fake Georgine's wrist. Then she'd ordered for the woman to be taken to the ivory tower where the imposter teleported from the book room had suddenly fallen from the ceiling. Father was in the Foundations Hall at the time, so he had no way of knowing what was going on outside, Melkor said. He came out when Mother sent word of Lady Georgine's capture intending to head to the ivory tower and see her with his own eyes. But when the other Lady Georgine appeared, Mother sent him another ordinance telling him to return to the Foundation. Valencia had discovered that Georgine was using body doubles right after Sylvester had sent Ferdinand an ordinance announcing their enemy's capture. Okay. So how long did it take them to get from Gerlock to- No! Not Gerlock to- No, that's a uh, teleporter. Okay, uh... How long did they have to wait between when they got that message and when the, uh, Sylvester arrived? Let me know. I don't know. And the real Georgine also entered through the temple I asked my head cocked. She did, Melkor whispered. Her sh his shoulder slumped. I was ordered not to join the battles outside, so I was in my room when I received the news that the woman we thought was Lady Georgine triggered all of our traps. We were lured into a false sense of security. The knights not reporting to me went to check on the fighting by the gate, leaving the book room unattended. That was when Lady Georgine, the real one, got inside. And nobody saw her? There were plenty of knights at the gates, weren't there? There were three gates leading into the temple, each of which had its own guard shoe mill. As I understood it, the shoe mill positioned at the gate for a carriage had moved at some point, but the pedestrian gate was so close by that I didn't consider it an issue. I also found it hard to believe that the Judith and the others wouldn't have noticed the carriage gate opening and responding instantly. My concerns didn't end there, though. The temple's was a fairly large place. How had Georgine reached the book room without running into a single person? She used another, more unusual entrance. I guess you likewise didn't consider it, sister. Hmm? During the end to account, we added a waterway to the temple, remember? To aid the creation of paper in the workshop? Indeed, we had made a passage connecting the temple and the river. It wasn't being used yet, so we still needed to set up a way to purify the water and such. The real Lady Georgine used that waterway as a secret passage. Melkor explained, she must not have been able to wash in while wearing her silver clothes, so we found her footprints near the exit by the boys' building. 
From there, she entered the noble section from the west side of the basement, which the servants and those bringing food from the lower city used. Then she waited in one of the blue priest's quarters until the book room wasn't being watched. We assumed the priest who accommodated her and her attendant made the arrangements. So which one was it? The real Georgine, the one Sylvester had dispatched, had apparently been dressed in gray robes. Okay. It made sense that nobody had paid any attention to her, especially when another Georgine had just blundered into a bunch of traps. Were they... Lady Rose, mind high shits called out just as I was beginning to calm down. He approached me with a smile, bringing along an attendant carrying a plate filled with piled with delicacies. How do you like the food, I asked. Hyshit shot his plate a very satisfied grin. It's delicious, and there is so much variety. I've enjoyed this food plenty of times during the Archduke Conference, but it tastes so much sweeter than when you've just seized a victory. Oh, yeah. That said, your plate is largely empty. I am having my attendant retrieve the occasional portion of my di favorite dis dishes. In any case, I suspect the amount I normally eat would seem paltry to a knight. I take only a few bites, but I savor each and every one. This is the only season we can serve Vargo with cream sauce, so do try some while you can. As a host, I was almost obligated to share in the food we were serving to our guests. I ate some with a smile, but I couldn't taste it at all, mainly because I wasn't really hungry. Tell me, is the alcohol to your taste as a Dunkelfelgerian? But of course, Heisitz declared, it is much stronger than the, the vies we normally use. I normally enjoy it, but the flavor is excellent. He held up his full cup with a pleased grin, evidently relieved to have something new to drink. I think that's hard liquor, though. Should you really be drowning so downing so much of it? Ferdinand had been right to worry. If we'd invited all of Dunkelfelger's volunteers, Erefest's entire supply of alcohol would have vanished overnight. Um, Lord Heishitz, may I ask a question, Roderick asked, his excitement should clear on his face. Heishitz gave a generous nod and roared, Ask away, boy! The alcohol was making him especially boisterous. Is it true that Dunkelfelger suffered not a single fatality? You fought so many tough battles back to back that I can hardly believe it. Please tell me the secret to your strength. By the end of the Battle of Gerlach, there had been ten rows of ten Dunkelfelger knights ready to hear the declaration of victory. Handler and Heischitz had been on the balcony with me as their commanders. In other words, there hadn't been a single person unaccounted for. We managed it only because of Lord Ferdinand and Lady Rosemont, Heishit said, his expression turning more serious. We were warned to adv in advance to cover our mouths and keep our jerrys with us. More than ten of our knights ended up with serious mana clots from that poison bomb, Grossom Launch, but none died instantly. It did far more damage to the enemy forces and Gerlach's knights since they did not know the peculiarities of the attack. Many of them turned into face stones in merely a moment. At once, the sight of all those gleaming face stones littering the ground resurfaced in my mind. Goosebumps rose on my skin, and the food that I had eaten pushed up against my throat. I covered my mouth and swallowed it back down. The last thing I wanted to do was embarrass myself. Rose, mine, Ferdinand said from somewhere out of my sight. I turned around just as the door to the hall was thrown open. Rose, mine, are you out of harm's way? I've come to save you. What the fuck? Oh, what a fascist! It was what a fascist, fully armored. He barreled in like a bull in a china shop, it surprised me so thoroughly that my nausea instantly vanished. Oh, nice. Everyone was staring at him in a complete daze, but he ignored them all as he looked me up and down, confirming I was okay. There is not a single scratch on me, Grandfather. Thanks to you, I am doing fine. That last part wasn't totally a lie. He had just saved me from making a very embarrassing scene. I see, he replied with a relieved nod, and then rounded on Sylvester. What's this about you starting the feast without me? You charged up the teleporter without a second thought for Ferdinand. Oh, what about me? It wasn't easy having to rush all the way here from Ilgner. We don't have the man to despair, Sylvester shot back. The only reason we could fuel the teleporter for Ferdinand and Rosemont was because they helped supply it. Besides, look, I was right that you'd still make it here in time. Sylvester must have refused to activate the teleporters for Board of Fascists alone. I thought that was reasonable enough, considering, especially when our main focus right now was sharing intelligence with Dunkelfelder. But there was no reason for me to weigh in. Rose, my tell by the fascists you want to hear about Ilgner, Ferdinand whispered, having at some point moved to stand behind me. Use the opportunity to convince him to get changed. I nodded and approached our loud new arrival. Grandfather, we have guests from Dunkelfelger here at the moment. Why not get changed and tell me tells he her heroics? As I understand it, Bridget sent an ordinance uh, bearing critical information when the fighting was already underway. I am curious to know how things were in Ilgner. But a fascist nodded, now grinning from ear to ear. All right, you got it. Just wait right there. I'll tell you everything. He turned to leave without another word, and with that, I gained one more feather in my cap. Huh? Okay, what does that mean? 
To make sure if people weren't restricted with whom they could speak with, nobody at the feast had a designated seat. Those who wished to sit down could take any chair at any of the tables set up along the outer edges of the hall. This had been Aaron Fest's solution to the sudden nature of the feast and the fact that they hadn't known how many Dunkelfelger knights were going to attend. Once he was changed, but a fascist came over to where I was seated and got his attendant to fetch him some food. Sylvester sat next to him, ready to hear his report while Karstis stood behind them, having finally secured a free moment to attend. Ferdinand was sitting in the last remaining seat as though were only natural. Now, as you know, Ilgner's a long way away from here. But a fascist wasn't exaggerating. The province in question was located at Aaronfest's southwesternmost corner. He explained that flying there would have taken his knights an entire day because they would need it to match the speed of his lay nobles of the lay nobles among them. Going any faster than that would most likely have exhausted them, and what use would they have been if they were too tired to fight? True. If we'd given ourselves the usual amount of time to get there, he continued, we'd have arrived to find Ilgner in ruins. Aaron's buck is a greater duchy. Their knights and old workstocks nobles are far too much for a men noble's province to fight back alone. Ilgner's population was slowly on the rise, but it was still a mountainous, forest-covered territory with few nobles or commoners to speak of. And it wasn't like Ilgner could devote resources to defending it. They had a lot of land to protect, and very few protectors. I suspected that they would have crumbled in the face of an attack from a greater duchy. Thus, the Ob used teleportation circles to transport us to Ilgner's summer estate. It seemed to waste not to utilize them when we knew they were there. Aaron Fest's teleporters were to be used were to be used carelessly. Only the op could activate them, and the prior process of transporting a person, let alone an entire group, required a ton of mana. The only reason we'd used them at the beginning was because the fighting hadn't yet reached the city of Aaron Fest, meaning those stationed there had time to drink rejuvenation potions and recover their mana. As soon as I arrived in Ilgner, I realized the attack was merely a diversion meant to lure away the night's order, Bonifacius said. <sighs> Sorry. How did you know? I asked. There were fewer invaders than expected, and their goal didn't seem to be cut to conquer the Gives estate. The enemy had sent enough knights that Ilgner wouldn't have been able to endure on their own, avoided combat, and made zero attempts to claim the province before the reinforcements from Aaronfest had arrived. On top of that, they had made the unusual decisions to devote some of their forces to Grievel and to steal mana from the land they were invading. They hadn't been particularly challenging foes for Bonifacius, but they had proven to be annoying. But a fascist gave a proud snort, then burst into laughter. That said, they likely intended to stick around and fight for two to three days. You should have seen their faces after we traveled there by teleporter. Under normal circumstances, a Gibbs call for reinforcements wouldn't have been answered right away. Plenty of time would have been spent to deciding which knights would sort it with sortie and preparing them for battle before they even started their journey by High Beast. It would have taken days for one of Ashes and the others to reach Ilgner, but because we'd already anticipated the attack and gathered the information we needed about our teleportation circles, they managed to get there in the blink of an eye. You make it sound trivial, but I really broke my back getting that circle to work, Sylvester grumbled. It was during our fight this morning that we found out Gerlach was under attack too, Bonifacius continued, completely ignoring his nephew. They said there were so many troops that this had to be the main invasion and requested reinforcements as quickly as we could provide them. I wanted to head straight there, but for us to fight unburdened, we had to wrap things up in Ilner first. Bonifacius had riled his troops. Then, under Bridget's guidance, they had flown all throughout the province, tearing their enemies to shreds. Father, why did you feel the need to go to Gerlach? Karstead asked. I could guess from his business-like expression that he was speaking as the night commander. Bonifacius likewise became more serious, no longer exuding the aura of a man bragging to his granddaughter. Gerlach had a more dangerous scent to it. I could feel that I needed to get there as soon as possible. A dangerous scent? Right. I sensed there was a mighty foe there, not that even I could, one that even I would struggle against. You... Sensed it. Bonifacius really was animalistic. He had a sharp nose and acted on pure instinct. I could see why Grossman had devoted so much of his play into countering him. Bridget wasn't hurt, wasn't she? Was she? I asked. She used to be my guard knight, so I can't help worrying about her. She even such as valuable intelligence in the midst of the fighting. I see, Bonifacius replied, looking conflicted. Bridget might have left, but she's still your retainer at heart. The information she sent should have gone to the Knight's Order, but instead she insisted on it going to you, even when her ordinances kept falling. That's the thought process of a retainer who wishes to add more prestige to her lady's name. It hadn't occurred to me that Bridget's actions were so significant. She hadn't just wanted to warn me of the coming danger. She was still trying to prop me up as her lady despite having left my service years ago. Knowing that made joy spread through my entire body, it warms my heart to know she feels that way even now that we're so far apart, I replied sincerely. But a fascist nodded, you have good vassals, Rosemine. So, how is Bridget? Hmm, her skills as a knight have dulled a little. It's to be expected. Beards in a pregnancy will stop anyone from training. But I still consider it a shame. 
I had meant how she was doing as a person, not what she was like in battle, but I suppose that I shouldn't have expected anything else from Bonifacius. His evaluation told me that Bridget was doing well at least. Besides, rusty or not, she performed admirably as a knight defending her province, Bonifacius noted. She fought hard to protect the mountains, forests, since your workshops need them to make paper. She carried out her duty as the Gibbs' younger sister and protected her both her home and its people. Subsequently, the two of them had captured the invading Gibbs of old workstock. I was dumbfounded when an Ordnance showed up midway through our battle, saying that you and Ferdinand were leading Dunkelfugger knights into Gerlach. I mean, I remembered how confident you were before you left, but I never thought you'd actually manage to save Ferdinand and get back to Erefest so soon. Well done, Rosemine, well done. I thank you ever so much, Grandfather, and I applied as a warm feeling spread through my chest. His words meant a lot to me, especially considering that he told me to give up on the rescue operation entirely. You protected a great many things, if you ask me. There I was, praying that Gerlach wouldn't hold out until would hold out until my arrival. Then I was suddenly told you'd put a stop to the fighting. I actually smacked the ordnance that delivered the news on instinct since I was sure it had to be broken. <laughs> Just like smacking the little white bird. Oh my god. That's funny. Sorry, I had to stop, take a drink. You smacked it! <laughs> the poor thing wasn't broken before. I think it must have done it! <laughs> oh my god! Dunkelfeather's knights fought exceptionally hard for us during the Battle of Gerlach, I said. Then I pointed at Handlor, who was joyously speaking with some of the other noblewomen, including my friend over there. Still, you led them, did you not? Not quite. Ferdinand was the one who took the knights to Gerlach. He roused them by saying that stealing Aaron's box foundation wasn't enough. To mark the end of our dinner match. I was bedridden in Erasbach's castle when he and the troops departed. Despite having been had only a few moments to rest since almost succumbing to poison, Ferdinand had taken the initiative to lead the charge into Gerlach. I made sure to emphasize how amazing that was, which must have made Bonifacius a little jealous. He looked at Ferdinand and huffed. I mean, dude, the guy had been who knows how long it would have had before he would have actually died from the poison. So, I mean, him doing that after Dealing with the poison, and after that fight in Ehrensbach, I think it's really amazing. So, yeah, I think that praise is very well much for deserved. But if Ashes continued, once the situation in Gerlach was dealt with, I petitioned the Ob to reactivate the teleporter so we could return to Ehrenfest. He refused and told us to make our own way back, since he was already using the circles to teleport you, Ferdinand, and your Dunkelfelder guests. Yes, from a greater duchy, clearly take priority over returning troops, Sylvester said. Not to mention Rosemine's calling for me. Isn't a good enough excuse to use a teleporter. No ob should allow that. Or no ob would allow that. The invasion had wreaked absolute havoc on Aaronfest's stock of rejuvenation potions, and the diversionary battles being fought all over the place had exhausted the knights. On top of that, the scholars and attendants had been up to their necks and were preparing for the celebratory feast. There simply hadn't been any leeway to use a teleporter for Bonifacius' sake. Plus, I'm pretty sure I didn't call for him. Bonifacius claimed otherwise. He'd charged straight to Erebus, leaving his knights behind. That must have been why he'd roared that he was here to save me, I thought. But his behavior was so instinctual that it was hard to say for sure. He actually seemed a little more scary than reliable at this point. I fully understood why Grossom had devoted so much time and effort to countering him. Bonifacius was someone I never wanted to make an enemy of. Oh, definitely. So how are things here, Bonifacius asked. Sylvester shrugged and shook his head. He had spent most of today listening to others' reports, trying not to discuss his own side of the story when he could avoid it. It started with the Ordnons Daniel sent to the Knights Order, relaying Bridget's message. As it turns out, that was around Third Bell, I think. The Knights Order had mobilized upon hearing that threats were likely about to arrive at the West Gate. Ordnons had flown out over, and everyone had moved to their, their pre-planned stations. They hadn't known when exactly the threats would appear or when the battle would commence. Meanwhile, Sylvester had gone straight to the Foundation's Hall since his theft was the absolute worst-case scenario. I stood there and waited, he told us. There wasn't anything for me to do, but I didn't have any other choice. I simply waited around and received Ordnons through a hole in the wall open just for that purpose. As it turned out, there was a war pole connecting the hall and the Archduke's office, allowing the Ob to receive correspondence even while attending to the Foundation. Sylvester had spent his time waiting for an Ordnance to stick its beak through, speak its report, and then return. So, he continued with nothing else to do, I started setting up traps I devised with Rosemine. Sylvester had gotten so bored that prior to the start of the fighting at the West Gate, he had sent Ordnance to his attendants, asking them to deliver him the tools he would need to set up his own traps. 
Is it really acceptable for the OB to do that kind of work, I asked? Well, it wasn't like I could delegate. I was the only one there. Yeah, and you can't really have anybody come in to help you with that, because only the Archduke only the Archduke family can come in, and everybody else is busy. In the process of killing time, Sylvester had put glue on the stairs and set up nets and wash tubs to fall on any intruders. Back in Japan, wash tubs were made of very light material, so dropping one on a person's head was more of a gag than anything else, like watching someone slip on a banana peel. Here in Jurgen Smith, however, they were commonly made of thick, heavy wood. I don't even want to imagine how much that would hurt. What if Georgine had died from it? I wouldn't even know how to feel. Maybe it was my fault for not having explained things properly, but I never expected Sylvester to use a wooden wash tub. To use, I never expected Sylvester to use a wooden wash tub, not a metal one. Or not just came even as I was setting up more traps. One told me Bonifacius was leading Ilgner to victory. Then I received a request for reinforcements from Gerlach. Sylvester had ordered the Gibbs near Gerlach to mobilize their knights and assist the province in need. Then he probed to see whether Bonifacius would also be able to head there. In the case of the Gibbs, the responses he received hadn't given him much hope. They had declared that they couldn't risk sending troops to Gerlach when there was a serious chance that their own provinces might be invaded next. True. That is true. They gotta be careful. Because they had no idea who was going to be attacked. That seemed reasonable to me. A game who was unable to protect their land because they had sent their knights elsewhere would be considered an absolute failure of a ruler. True. Mustering reinforcements for Ilgner hadn't been an issue, but the circumstances had changed since then. Sending the knights tasked with protecting the nobles' quarter hadn't been an option. Not when there were threats approaching the city. On top of that, Sylvester, the one person required to activate the Duchess' teleportation circles, had been stuck in the Foundation Hall. You couldn't even leave that, yeah. Gabe Gerlach sent more ordinances, each one reporting that his situation was getting worse. Things got so bad that I decided to use the teleporters to send as many nights as I could. But as I went to leave the hall, one of my scholars told me we received a message from Ferdinand. Ferdinand had announced that I'd stolen Aaron's box foundation and that he was bringing Duckefeller's volunteers to the border gate between our duchies. Once there, he would contain the rogue knights and nobles acting under Georgine's influence. That shocked me more than anything. Never in my life have I felt the gods' intervention so clearly. Gluckletat really must love you, I said. Sylvester so ordered a scholar to contact Ferdinand and tell him to head to Gerlach at once. And Ornans wouldn't have reached him or me while we were in Aaron's box, so he needed to send a physical letter to the border gate. Around the same time, he'd contacted Gabe Gerlach using an Ornans to explain that Ferdinand and I were on our way with Dunkelfelger Nut troops and that he needed only to hold out until we arrived. The attack on the west gate began during that exchange, then the fighting at the north gate and the temple with it. Florencia sent word that someone was moving through the secret passageways. Everyone was putting their necks on the line while I was stuck waiting with the foundation. And while Sylvester had waited, fighting back the urge to run out and join the fight, Florencia had sent word that she'd captured Georgine. I thought the battle had come and gone before I could do anything of use, Sylvester said. That must have been discouraging for him, but still, our victory was what mattered most. Sylvester had then left the foundation, having decided to go to the Ivory Tower, and started informing the provinces that Georgine had been captured. He was stopped in his tracks, however, by the arrival of another Ordonnance. A second Lady Georgine has appeared, the bird had said in Florencia's voice, her panic unmistakable. She fell from the ceiling, so I suspect she was teleported from the temple. There may be other decoys. Please stay with the foundation until the real Lady Georgine has been found. I did as she instructed without a second thought, Sylvester told us. Georgine was exactly the kind of person to stack one devious plot on top of another. Uh-huh. I went back to the Ops chambers in the castle and teleported to the Foundations Hall, only to be caught up in a torrent of water. What? What? The moment I stepped through the iridescent screen, I was struck in a whirlpool and gasping for air. The real Lady Georgine had been already been attacking the Foundation. Aw, oh, shit. The blood had drained from Sylvester's face when he realized that if not for Florencia's second ordinance, the duchy would have been stolen right under his nose. The whirlpool eventually disappeared, dropping me to the ground. The wash tub I'd set up came crashing down too. Wait, what? The wash tub? I asked. The traps I'd placed were caught up with me. I managed to avoid the wash tub, but only by a hair. It nearly knocked me right out. Flooding a room with washing wasn't just swept, wouldn't just sweep away the people inside. I'd experienced that personally when casting the spell for the first time. Everything would float, and anything the caster saw as filth would be cleansed. The glue I put on the stairs disappeared, and the other traps I'd set were moved from where I'd placed them, Sylvester explained. It was as the washtub came down at my feet that I spotted a hand sticking out from another entrance, and a shiver ran down my spine. The hand, I'm guessing she did that to make sure that there wasn't any, you know, poison, traps, whatever. I'm assuming that's what she did. The hand, which had apparently appeared to be severed at the wrist, had apparently been wielding a stab. Georgine had likely used a lethal attack without even looking into the room. 
And with that realization, the horror eating away at Sylvester had grown even more intense. I think a floating head would scare anyone, I said. Sylvester had also taken out her staff, and Georgine had sauntered into the room barely a moment later. Despite being dressed in the robes of a great shrine maiden, she had acted entirely like a queen. Georgine's eyes widened in disbelief when she saw me! <laughs> We caught you! We caught you there! Ha ha! You ain't getting us! Sylvester continued, That makes no sense, Ferdinand said. At a time when the city is facing countless diversions, anyone would expect the odd to be protecting the Foundation. Oh! Okay, that explains it. So, him leaving had saved his life, actually. Okay. What she did, she first... Put the poison in the room to kill Sylvester, thinking that he was in there. And then, when she thought that it worked, she used washing to wipe away the poison. That's what happened. Sylvester's brow furrowed in discomfort. It was precisely because Georgine knew I was going to be in the Foundation's hall that she filled it with instant death poison. Excuse me? Outside, instant death poison powder didn't work very well. It carried on the wind and dissipated in easily in a cramped space like the hall, however... Its gruesome potential would have been fully realized. Georgine had unlocked the foundation, thrown in some poison bombs, and then cleansed the room with a washing so that she could enter under any other circumstances. Her plan would have allowed her to die or destroy the foundation without anyone interfering. If not for my decision to leave the foundation after Florencia's first ordinance, I wouldn't even be here right now, Sylvester said. You truly have received Gluclotat's divine protection. Definitely. To be honest, I think it's more likely that my opponent had no protections at all. I can only imagine how Georgine must have felt when her carefully devised plans had been foiled purely by her enemy getting lucky. So how did you capture Georgine from there? I was already holding my staff, so of course I attacked without hesitation. To account for the distance between them, Sylvester had created a bow and shot arrows of mana and Georgine. One was turned away by a charm she had with her, and another she blocked with Gatelt. My next move was to advance on her. She threw some metallic needles at me in response, but one of my charms deflected them. It wasn't a tough fight by any means. She needed to remove her silver clothes to enter the Foundation's Hall, so mana attacks worked on her just fine. Okay, good. The battle had gone overwhelmingly in Sylvester's favor. That didn't surprise me, really. As a man who had undergone physical training since his youth, he had possessed far more strength, stamina, and combat experience than Georgine, who, as a woman, had spent her life mainly focused on socializing. Sylvester had also been compressing his mana and was armed with the strength of new divine protections to say nothing of how much younger than he was, than her he was, there was no way he would have lost a head on a counter. Oh yeah, he's gotten a lot more divine protection since he was last, since, you know, since then. Still, he muttered, I can't believe a person would grow to hate someone so intensely. Sylvester didn't reveal what Georgine had said to him, but the look on his face made it clear that her words had cut him deep. Oh, I want to know what she said. But, as I was saying, she told me there was plenty of people still names sworn to her. She declared that these, those bound to her by submission contracts would carry on her will, and that she would destroy Aaronfest. And the threat of her name sworn was too great to ignore, Ferdinand said. Yep, I didn't know how many of them we'd miss during the Winter Purge, or what they might do when given that kind of order. Would they all go berserk and join the fighting? Would they spread that poison everywhere? I needed to stop her before even more people got hurt, so I dealt with her then and there. Oh, he killed her! Oh, okay, that makes more sense. From what I remember, I think it was the last part where they mentioned that once uh, Sylvester had dealt with her, a bunch of her names sworn died. Okay, that makes sense. Sylvester gazed down at his hands. He had taken the life of his own sister, and the fact weighed so heavily on his heart. Oh, he needs a hug. He needs a hug. Come on, give him a hug. There was a pause, and then a dull clunk as he set something on the table. It was a large, beautiful face stone that seemed both red and blue, just depending on the light. It took me a second to process what I was looking at, but when the pieces of fell into place, my breath caught in my throat. Um, what? Oh, her face stone. Oh, he did. He did do it. Oh. Oh, boy. Now all we gotta deal with is Detlin and her stupid ass. My breathing became ragged and my entire body started to tremble. I tried to stand up. My every instinct was screaming at me to get away from the face stone. But I neglected to ward my attendants and so they hadn't pulled my chair back for me. Oops. Uh. 
So they hadn't pulled my chair back for me. My knees banged against the table and my seat toppled over backwards with a loud clatter. Oopsie. In an instant, all eyes were on me. I couldn't see my attendants as they were standing behind me, but I could sense that even now they were staring holes through the back of my head. This isn't good. I need to smooth this over somehow. As I gazed around the hall, frantically searching for an excuse to get away from the face stone, I saw Florencia and Charlotte. Um, I suddenly remembered something I must discuss with Charlotte and my adoptive mother, I said. I must ask them to gather their seamstress for my fitting. Isn't that right, Lizletta? That is urgent, but this is neither the time nor place to discuss it, Lizletta replied. She placed a hand on my shoulder and gently urged me to sit back down. But I wouldn't survive another moment at this table. Uh-oh. Even as my vision blurred, I couldn't stop staring at the face stone. My entire body was pleading me for me to get away. But I must return to Aaron's Bach tomorrow afternoon, and I've grown so much that I no longer have clothes to wear when meeting with the royal family. The fitting will need to be done in the morning. The seamstresses will not be able to gather in time, not even if we sent a messenger first thing tomorrow. Moreover, the castle is in no state to accept merchants. The fitting can wait until you have returned from No, we can't! Rose mind Ferdinand said, interrupting Lay's letter. Yes, I asked. Turning to look at him, remove the face. Turning to look at him. Remove the face stone from my sight and ease the tension in my shoulders. He had spent this conversation thus far wearing a fake smile to hide his displeasure, but now he'd returned to his usual emotionless expression. Okay, so he's normal, okay. We have something to discuss, he said, then indicated a relatively empty section of the room. We were about to leave when Brother Fascist raised a hand. Hold it, Ferdinand. Can that not wait, too? Look at the state of the feast. I agree, Lenore added. Please do wait until we are done here. The situation right now is in quite complex. I placed a hand on my cheek, unsure what either of them meant. My confusion must have been obvious because Lenore and Lazletta elaborated. To save ourselves time, we had used Kernberger's country gate as part of our charge to Ehrensbach. The province's knights had seen me activated, as had Sylvester's retainers, and the whole thing had eventually led to Ehrenfest's higher-ups, discovering that I possessed the Grudgeshite, and that the Archduke had given me a counter-courting magic tool from the royal family. Uh-oh. And it took only three days for that information to spread to the nobles' quarter, huh? Well, duh, people gossip, and that gets around quick. Lenore continued, the moment the Ob handed the royal magic tool to you, he demonstrated his intention to approve the royal courtship. The nobles now consider the cancellation of your engagement to Lord Wilfrid is a foregone conclusion. Many have also been discussing this unreasonable length you went to in order to save Lord Fernand. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, this is going to cause some really spicy rumors to pop up. Aaron Fest nobles now thought I was engaged to a royal. That was fair enough, but they were also under the impression that I was spending the short while... Of before the next Archduke conference, uh, when the news was going to be announced, bemoaning my doomed feelings for her hand. That was why the noble women were all wearing such warm smiles and going on about the beauty of love unfulfilled. Ah! The real tragedy here is that everyone's pitying me for losing my first love. I've never even been in love. Oh, God. We've benefited from the romanticization of your trip to Aaron's Bucklenor noted. That said, with your move to the sovereignty right around the corner, we do not want to chance any more scandals. <sighs> Our situation will be much easier to manage if everyone believed my feelings, quote unquote, for Ferdinand were one sided and would end with my marriage into the royal family. For that reason, it was important that he kept his distance from me. We kinda can't at the moment because she's thinking, oh, I'm Aaron's Buck. So kinda can't. Ferdinand casts his eyes across the table at my retainers and the other guests casually looking in our direction, then crosses arms inside. I consider Rosemine's health more urgent and important than public opinion. However, if you would all rather prioritize gossip and rumors, I will respect that. Good. What? I think her health and all that is more important right now. Everyone seemed relieved that Ferdinand was pulling back, but it made me uneasy. I turned to look at him. It's been a year and a half since my departure, Ferdinand said. Rosemine must have a new primary doctor by now. It would not be right for me to encroach on their duties, unless you mean to tell me a new doctor has still not been assigned to her. And that's immediately true. As far as we know, we have no primary doctor for, for Rosemine right now. Sylvester and Carson immediately averted their eyes, of course. Ferdinand glared at them both and then slowly began to stand up again, muttering that I should call him if I ever needed any help. No, she should call me, but a fascist for You are not a doctor! Ferdinand stared down at him, clearly annoyed before turning around and leaving. A strange sense of panic spread through me as he got further away. If nothing else, I didn't have another doctor to rely on, and my body clearly wasn't acting right. Lenore, I... Wait until the feast is over. No! 
There are too many eyes here, Lenore whispered while urging me to sit back down. You may not be aware, but you are drawing more than enough attention simply because of your growth spurt. Cornelius is left to gather intelligence, and Lord Ferdinand just went to speak of Hartman. Please refrain from acting openly. <sighs> she was advising me as a guard knight, but I still shook my head. I didn't want to stay here. I stood up and took my leave, using the excuse of needing to speak with Charlotte, Florencia, and Elvira. Only once I was away from the face and was I finally able to breathe again. Ugh! Did you guys not know that she was possibly having a panic attack or something? Y'all ain't very good guarders if y'all can't even tell how your, how your charge is feeling. I put on a fake smile and tried to force my way through the rest of the feast. Ferdinand must have given out all sorts of orders as his retainers were rushing around the room as busily as ever. On that, okay, on that note, where might he be, I asked. Ferdinand returned to your library quite some time ago. It is too late to call on him now. Could you wait until tomorrow? I'd intended to stick around until the end of the feast, but there was no helping it without Ferdinand. I couldn't even justify calling him back. I wasn't feeling too bad now that I was away from the face stone, so my condition couldn't have been urgent. There was nothing for me to do but return to my chambers. Okay, so we know the Georgine threat is taken care of. Okay. Which means that even if they hadn't gotten the real Grossum... They've gotten him now because Georgine's dead. So all her names sworn, including him, are now dead. A sleepless night. I was back at the Battle of Gerlock. Blue Cape Knights surrounded me on all sides with their shields raised, blocking as much of my view that I couldn't tell where we were or what we were going where we were going. Explosions nearly blinded me, shouts drowned out all of the noise, and arrows whisked through the air as I pressed in my under my high beast. My heart pounded in my chest and my ears rang. It was hard to breathe and despite the overwhelming fear that gripped me and made me want to flee, my hands refused to leave my steering wheel. I couldn't move entirely as though I turned into a face stone. I saw a dazzling flash of rainbow light, then all sorts of things started shoot, shout, shooting toward me. The clashing of metal and even more shouts reached my ears before sprays of red into my vision. Oh! A severed arm struck my pandemus, then a knight who had fallen from his high beast dropped in front of me. Ah, oh, shit! I plowed right through him, causing him to bounce up into the air and out of sight. Sorry! All the while, face stones continued to strike the windshield. Oh! The force of each impact reverberated through my steering wheel. My body turned cold as ice and my teeth chattered violently and hurt to breathe. I'm guessing this is a nightmare she's having. Tears welled from my eyes and rolled down my cheeks all on their own. The portions of the fight where my emotions had shut down now seemed so very clear to me as though a thick fog had suddenly lifted. They repeated over and over again, refusing to fade from my memory. A man thanked me profusely for coming to his rescue. Then a moment later he fell from the sky as a face stone. Oh, great! I drove into the room ahead of me and saw the gibe collapse on the floor, already in the process of turning into a face stone. My stomach dropped as I clenched my teeth and awful sensations spread through my mouth as though I were chewing sand. Cold sweat covered me from head to toe. I'm guessing she's dreaming about all the people she couldn't save. All those face stones were people. Good lord. And then there was Grossum, laughing derisively as he absorbed every attack thrown at him with the mass of black face stones that, that was on his arm. With his arm. His ear-piercing cackle repeated again and again, starting out fast and agonizingly high-pitched before slowly warping into a low drone. He swung his fire-engulfed arm, burning everything in sight. The flames faded away, revealing that half of his body had turned into a sickening mass of face stones. I'm guessing that was not the real Grossum, possibly? I don't, I don't know anymore! How am I supposed to know? I guess it doesn't matter anymore because he is dead at this point. Some seemed to dig into his flesh while others merely rushed to the top, and he was well and truly monstrous. In the blink of an eye, Grossum charged toward me, reaching out his prosthesis. I fired my water gun at him, hoping to stop his advance, but that only made the rest of his face turn into a face stone. Even then, I could see the murderous hatred in his expression and the madness gleaming in his gray eyes. Every time where I looked, there were face stones. Face stones, face stones. I screamed at the top of my lungs as they all closed in on me. Yep, it's a nightmare. Stay away! I leaped up and realized that I was back in bed. My entire body was so damp with sweat that my bed clothes clung to me and my hair stuck to my skin. A chill seeped into my bones as the cold air prickled my bare neck. The nights were frigid even now that we were approaching the height of spring. I mean, spring is going to be a little chilly until it gets really going. My heart pounded and each breath felt more in inbred labor than the rest. Or at last, the contents of my dream spun through my mind as I lay motionless in bed. Every now and then I saw what could only have been the glimmer of a face stone falling through the darkness. I pressed one hand over my mouth trying not to vomit and rested the other on my chest hoping to calm my nerves. I feel sick. I don't blame her. Poor thing, she's been through a lot. 
Each time I tried to remember the battle before the feast, my mind returned to a cloudy mess of memories. Maybe it was a defense mechanism? Possibly. I need to speak with Ferdinand about this, I muttered, but as I reached my bedside table, wanting to send an ordinance, I paused. Even the thought of touching this yellow face stone made my stomach turn. Oh. At last, I steeled my nerves and yanked open the drawer. The magic tool was sitting inside, and at once, the face stones that had tormented me in my dream all came to mind. It suddenly became hard to breathe like there was something heavy weighing on my chest. Even knowing the tool was just an ordinance, I couldn't muster the courage to grab it. I squeezed my hand shut and let my arm fall to my side. What should I do? I won't be able to call for help like this. Yeah, I think she's going through a little bit of PTSD. A little... No, no she's going through a little bit of a... Is that it? Is that the one I'm thinking of? Oh, whatever. As an unknown fear assaulted my senses, I couldn't help but tremble. I wrapped my arms around my chest and squeezed, desperate for even the smallest trace of comfort. It was then that I had heard footsteps on the other side of my bed curtain. I shot bolt upright and drew my staff, ready to fight whatever threat away to be. Lady Rose, my, can we join you? She's in bed, Judith. Mind your phrasing. Those voices, they belong to Judith and Grisha. I remember they were on night watch. Then rushed to dispel my staff and wipe away the sweat uh, be beating on my neck. Lords Hartman and Ferdinand warned us this might happen. Oh. So they knew this could happen. Especially Ferdinand, considering how he knows that Rosemite's not even from that world. She's from a world where she wouldn't have encountered all this. Judith told me through the curtain, even trained knights can become emotionally unstable after an intense battle, so we were told to keep a very close eye on you and Lady Handler tonight. I was scared too when I saw what the poison did to those knights. Let me sit with you a while. Oh, I wish she could give you a hug. She drew my bed curtains and moved to join me. Grisha went to do the same, but when she saw my dre how drenched with sweat my bedclothes were, she decided to fetch me something to change into. Under normal circumstances, only adult knights would have participated in such a gruesome battle, Judith said, speaking into the darkness. We apprentices were so only sent out because the enemy had so many troops that we did. I had assumed she was going to ask me all sorts of uncomfortable questions, but her tone made it clear that she wasn't expecting me to respond. Relieved, I merely lay there in silence, listening. Almost every single one of the apprentices is staying in the Adnite's dormitory tonight since they were expected to struggle with the day's events. The higher-ups are speaking with them, and they're having sessions with doctors. Flowers are even available for anyone who requests them. Oh, no! Wait. Oh! Flowers! Whenever I read these books now, and I see the word mentioning requesting flowers, I keep on thinking... Uh, you know. I thought you might want some as well, Lady Rosman, which is why I asked Lady Florencia to let you visit one of the greenhouses. A trip there should calm you down in an instant. Yes. Yes, those kinds of flowers. Okay. Judith stuck out her chest, pleased with her solution to my worries. Little did she know the knights were enjoying flowers of another kind. <laughs> yeah, that is true. You could gaze upon the flowers while drinking some nice, fragrant tea. How does that sound, Lady Rosemine? Would it really be acceptable for me to go out this late at night, I asked? To my knowledge, the knights who had accompanied me to Aaron's Buck had all returned to the estates. Even if we asked Daniel to leave his post by the door to join me, I wouldn't have an adequate number of guards. As it stands, the castle is packed with knights, so we are free to head out as long as we inform the order. I spoke with them before coming here, so the arrangements have already been made. Oh, I guess they couldn't bring themselves to clear up Judas' misunderstanding. She had gone to the trouble of arranging this trip to the greenhouse, and not a single person had intervened. I elected to bite my tongue as well, and simply appreciated her kind gesture. I thank you ever so much, Judith. I look forward to our outing. Let me go tell the others, she said, with a joyful smile, and took her leave. Grisha returned just in time to replace her, looking worried. Are you sure about Judith in this, Lady Rosemine? Judith might be invested in the idea, but would it not be better for you to spend the night in bed, relaxing at your leisure? Truth be told, I had just awoken from an unpleasant dream when you arrived. I doubt... No! Schlachtron's blessings are going to reach me tonight, and a chance to stretch my legs doesn't sound nice. Not to mention, as far as my image is concerned, I would make more sense for me to spend the sleepless night in the greenhouse rather than with Ferdinand, don't you think? Otherwise, such an elaborate scheme would never have been concocted. In the past, any concerns to do with my well-being would have been dumped entirely on Ferdinand. A trip to the greenhouse wouldn't even have been humored. Ferdinand. 
and that way. Uh. Gracious brow furrowed, her eyes tinged with sadness. I apologize that I'm unable to grant your desires, Lady Rosemine. There's nothing need to there's no need to worry. Such is the nature of noble society. Grisha turned on a light, brought in a small tub filled with hot water, and fetched me some clothes to wear outside of my room. Then, once she had everything she needed, she stripped me down and started dabbing the sweat from my body with a light, tightly wrung towel. Growing up hair has its downsides, she muttered. The way everyone looks at you changes. You stop being able to do things that once seemed so normal to you, and in the end, I think you actually lose more freedoms than you gain. I matured earlier than most, so there was many times where I was denied something that others my age would be able to do freely. I found that completely unreasonable. I didn't think Grisha had changed all that much on the inside, but her growth spurt had caused a tremendous shift in how everyone treated her. Yeah, because you got to, started to go through puberty, and while well, they see you as an adult. We'd gone through more or less the same experience, so she could relate to my struggles being told to reconsider my relationship with Ferdinand and needing to put up with everyone speculating about my every move. I always thought I would enjoy catching up to everyone else, I said, but indeed, maturing has its ups and downs. A lot of things become more troublesome than not than not until your heart catches up with your body, Grisha added quietly, especially relationships with men. That's true. In silence, I cast my eyes over the girl who had given her name to me to escape her family. I could only imagine all the troublesome events she had gone through. I'm back, Judith announced, sounding as merry as ever. Lady Handler is also having a hard time getting any sleep, of course. According to her night watch attendant, she wishes to go out on the balcony to get some air. Perhaps you could invite her to the greenhouse. Knights tend to speak openly with their peers. Maybe now is a good time for you to interact with her like that. Judith was adamant that Handler and I could have understand each other. As authority figures, we are two candidates weren't allowed to join the knights in their dormitory while they were recovering from the terrors of the battlefield. Handler had seemed used to fighting as an Archduke candidate of Dunkelfugger, but maybe that hadn't actually been the case. Maybe this was her first time experiencing death on the battlefield? Had she spent the night thus far feeling as nauseous and aided as I was? Please invite Lady Handler through her not watch attendant. I told Judith, take care not to be too forceful. Understood. Speaking with Judith and Grisha had eased my worries a little, but the discomfort from my dream lingered. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw face stones of all sorts of colors. I was fleeing to the greenhouse to avoid more nightmares. I wish I could fall into such a deep sleep that I wouldn't dream at all. I know that. As that thought floated through my mind, Handler sent me an ordinance stating her desire to accompany me on my nighttime wander. The bird spoke its message three times, then turned into a yellow face stone. I couldn't bear to catch it, so it clattered down by my feet. Goosebumps froze on my skin as memories of the battlefield came rushing back to me. Okay, um, let me check. Okay, I'm going to have to end this one off here. I will see you guys in the next one. I'll try to get some more done tonight.